so what happens uh, with vocal fold inflammation, which the generic term of that is laryngitis, which is inflammation for many causes. Uh, inflammation actually is the first stage of wound healing. So it's an immune response which causes swelling and redness of the vocal fold tissue. And there's a lot of um, chemical markers that uh, create this inflammatory response, which is really the first sign that, that an injury is occurring. But normally there's a repair and rebuilding process as things called fibroblasts are uh, entering the scene and they start rebuilding this vocal fold tissue or scaffolding. And that type of vocal fold injury can be recovered from fairly quickly if given adequate rest. If there's not adequate recovery time, another stage of this wound healing occurs which is called granulation tissue. The most familiar example of granulation tissue you've probably encountered is a scab. It, but it's actually what occurs um, when you have a granuloma in the vocal folds. That's actually granulation tissue which the vocal fold is trying to uh, heal a wound in the posterior larynx. Unfortunately, if the process is uh, continues to the next stage, we have remodeling or scar tissue, which is mostly tough, tough collagen. So if a vocal fold injury goes to this stage, it's very hard to recover from because once scar tissue sets in, uh, that tissue usually never changes its composition and that tough collagen is not going to be deformable and pliable like the normal mucosal wave. And what's actually going to happen is it's almost like these rigging sites or scaffolding sites adhere to the lower level and become stiff and non-pliable. So you won't have any shearing of, of the um, epithelial layer and you won't get a mucosal wave. And if you don't get a mucosal wave, you don't get voice. And that's unfortunately what happened to Julie Andrews. I mentioned her a minute ago, but she had vocal fold surgery and unfortunately it was not successful and it resulted in permanent scarring of her vocal folds. But if this occurs, it's usually irreversible. And that's what we're trying to prevent when we keep inflammation at bay. We're trying to, to stop it at its source so it doesn't go through this process and goes all the way to remodeling. So how do we keep inflammation at bay? There's a series of vocal fold swelling tests that have been suggested by uh, an ENT named Dr. Bastian, and I've got the link to his website there. But this is a really easy way that we can teach our patients to monitor for changes in the voice that uh, indicate uh, inflammation is occurring. Um, we know that swelling increases phonation threshold pressure. Like I've mentioned already, phonation threshold pressure is the amount of force it takes, the minimum amount of force it takes to get vocal folds to start vibrating. And in normal vocal folds, that level is low, and it's easy to entrain the vocal fold into vibration. If you think about the example I just showed you, a vocal fold scar, that phonation threshold pressure is so great it can't even be exceeded. There's no way to get those vocal folds to vibrate. But obviously somewhere in the middle we can have vocal folds that are less or that are more reluctant to vibrate and it takes much more force to push them and to get them to start vibrating. And we know that the changes in phonation threshold pressure are first noticeable with high soft phonation. So swelling tests take advantage of this and it's kind of the canary in the coal mine phenomenon. If we notice changes with high soft phonation, that can be our first indication that we have inflammation occurring. So the way to do swelling tests is to do repeated staccato, which is means short um, and brief repetitions of something like And so we encourage that to be done as uh, soft as possible in the highest range. And then there are also soft pitch glides in the upper register. And then singing happy birthday or some other song sung softly in the highest range. Something like, happy birthday to I can't even do it. <laughs> happy birthday to you. So my phonation threshold pressure is increased in those upper ranges. I can't get that pitch to come out. But... The general idea is if you can train a, a patient to do this, 
and to do it frequently enough and at different times during the day, you can kind of establish a baseline when the voice is normal. Or if, if they're already injured, you can establish a baseline and then watch that baseline change. But um, someone who is a singer or a heavy voice user, if they know their baseline with these swelling tests, they can immediately detect a problem and take action, whether it be take, take a vocal break or get evaluated in an extreme circumstance. But the swelling test can kind of be the first indicator that there's inflammation occurring and then steps can be taken to reduce that inflammation if it has occurred. So that's a really good tool to have in your clinical toolbox and to teach your patients. And like I said before, you, your, your goal is for smooth, connected voice from top to bottom. Very similar to what vocal function exercises do. If you're familiar with those exercises, you make the semi-occluded posture of a and the idea is to do maximum pitch glide to the highest and maximum pitch glide to the lowest uh, pitch that the person can produce without a voice break with easy phonation. So the straw is nice because it does the work for you. You don't have to think about the oral posture. You're going to make it automatically by putting the straw in between your lips and you can do pitch glides all day long. Um, you probably have also seen, if you've watched Dr. Teets' videos online, I've got links for them at the end, doing um, what he calls hills. So you make increasingly higher uh, forays into upper register by going and also each one of those makes helps you engage um, diaphragm and ab abdominal muscles as you increase the airflow for the higher notes. But the nice thing about this is you can reach the upper register without strain and without hyperadducting the vocal folds because you have the semi-occluded vocal tract. I'll demonstrate briefly with the red straw just so you can see the difference or hear the difference. And I'm going to describe what I feel. Right away, I feel a lot more resistance. It's almost like my voice didn't even want to come out at first. But the idea is to see if you can do this with ease and let the voice come out the very, very occluded vocal tract. Obviously, once again, we have to keep thinking about vibration. Automatically, I realize I have to do less work here. If I push too hard, I get nothing. So I have to be very easy and kind of just let the straw do the work. That would actually take me some work. So this is definitely more advanced semi-occluded vocal tract exercise. So if it were me, I would probably want something in between these two sizes to start with. But um, if your patient can work with the smallest straw, then they've really made a lot of progress. But to change vocal pitch in terms of mass, you create muscle adjustments, which change the amount of vocal fold mass that's set into vibration. And if you have more mass vibrating, it will have a lower pitch. And the second uh, vocal property that is adjusted to create a change in pitch is vocal fold tension and once again that's the tension of the tissue that's vibrating not all the tissue will vibrate in, in every case but whatever is vibrating you have to account for its tension once again we make muscular adjustments to control the tension in both the body and the outer layers of the vocal folds more tension equals higher pitch now you may recall that we have two pitch change muscles that work interdependently to change uh, vocal fold pitch. The core or the body of the vocal fold is the thyroarytenoid muscle and think of that like your bicep. And if you kind of if you want to do this with me and in fact I'll just go ahead and uh, do this with the camera. I'm going to hold up my arm here. So if you think about your bicep being the body of the vocal fold, the thyroarytenoid muscle, you can tense and flex that muscle at will, which I, you won't be able to see very with my shirt, but I can tense up my bicep and make it tighter. I can increase its tension. And for most of the pitch changes we use in prosodic adjustments during speech, all we're doing is we're tensing and relaxing the vocal fold body. And as we tense the vocal fold bicep, or the, the vocal fold body, we get an increase in frequency of vibration. So I can 
can I can tense my vocal fold or I can relax my vocal fold. Okay, so we can get a fairly wide range of frequency adjustments just by tensing the body of the vocal fold. And that's, in this case, the pretty much the whole mass of the vocal fold is vibrating. So the the core and the outer layers are all vibrating at the same time. But we can get a big change in pitch just by tensing the bicep. Now, we can only tense the bicep so far, or we can only tense your vocal fold so far. I can, uh, and if I tense it, eventually, uh, it won't go any higher. So what we want to do at this point is we want to uh, engage the second vocal pitch change muscle, which is the cricothyroid. That's going to tilt the larynx forward, and it's going to elongate the vocal folds, putting tension on the outer layers, kind of like stretching a rubber band. So if we want to go uh, higher than the TA will allow us to go, we have to engage the CT. So that would be moving my wrist downward. So uh, now we're stretching the vocal fold out and tensing its outer layers by contracting the CT and elongating the vocal folds. Now we can do those two things simultaneously. We can be tensing and relaxing the TA while simultaneously tensing and relaxing the CT, which gives us the full range of vocal qualities and pitch range in the human voice. And that's where what we call vocal registers come in. And I'll talk about that in just a minute when we get to that slide. So we've already talked about how the vocal tract filter can change vowel sound, but we can also change uh, overall quality of the voice by the overall vocal tract length and shape by adjusting the pharynx and the height of the larynx and the position of the tongue. Think of this as kind of like turning up treble or turning up bass on a stereo. If you turn up the treble all the way and the bass all the way down, you get a thin, tinny, kind of screechy sound. But if you turn the treble all the way down and the bass all the way up, you'll get a very low, boomy sound. Uh, and we can do that with the voice as well. So I'm going to play two voice examples, and I want you to tell me what you hear, or you can't tell me, but tell yourself what you hear. Okay, we have that sound, and we have this sound. Okay, listen again. I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, so what was different? Um, were they the same pitch or were they different pitch? Many people might guess that the second voice was higher. In fact, people without musical training or knowledge about the voice might say that the second voice had a higher pitch. But if you listen to them again, they actually have the exact same pitch. <laughs> So I played them overlapping there so you could hear. Na, da, 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 that's the pitch they're on. It's not changed. But there's a very different sound in the two voices. And if you were to imagine the person creating those sounds, you know, imagine this is a cartoon character, I have a feeling most of you would imagine that the first one would be a large, oafish-looking character, and the second might be a small, squeaky-looking character. Uh, and that would be an accurate uh, perception because the first sound is created with a large, wide, long vocal tract, which emphasizes the lower harmonics of the voice, which is like turning up the bass. So it has a boomier, jolly green giant kind of sound. So that's someone with a low larynx, a wide pharynx, and a wide open mouth. The second one has, oops, would have a high larynx, a bunched up tongue, and a constricted pharynx. 